All right, so we are live. Um, I'm excited for the guest today. You know, Rodrigo, he is at Blue Future Partners. Um, they're a fund to fund. They've been a longtime mentor to myself and my community of fund managers. Um, and Rodrigo has um, grown to be a new friend. He's really um, shared some really deep ex expertise on the on the ecosystem in terms of venture and, and where it's heading. With all the stuff that's happened recently on the news, I thought it'd be great to go a little deeper. And also, I think a good topic that we can talk about is just um, a career path into being an LP. You know, there's a lot of content around how to be an emerging VC, how to break into VC. We've never really talked about how to be an LP and maybe break into LP. So um, I want to introduce everybody to the guests that I'm really excited to um, go deep on this. Rodrigo Ferreria, you know, he was one of the early employees at Blue Future Partners. They're based in Munich. Um, they, you know, he specifically focuses on sourcing and leading new investments and follow on opportunities in early stage venture capital funds and growth state techno technology software companies. Um, he's an entrepreneur at heart. And um, he's he's deep in the you know startup ecosystem. One thing that's really interesting with Rodrigo, which I've been following, is just his travels. You know, he's gone you know to so many different countries and has gone deep in the startup ecosystem. So I think those are some good topics to um, to talk about as well. You know, things that you've observed, Rodrigo. But you know, why don't we kick this off? Excited to have you on. Maybe you can start with your early career. And, you know, again, how do you break into LP? Maybe talk about your journey, um, what you studied um, and how you navigated into this industry. Like all of us, you know, there isn't a traditional straightforward path. We all end up in uh, in VC in different ways. So would love to maybe have you kick off with that. Just talk about your early um, journey, your upbringings with your family and how you broke into LP. Yeah, Joel, of course, happy to. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, so uh, I'm Rodrigo. I'm originally Portuguese, so I was born and raised in Lisbon. Um, did my, my initial studies there, like high school and kind of the two bachelors there uh, in management and, and the economics area. Uh, and then decided to that I wanted to have also the experience of studying abroad. Um, I mean, Lisbon is always a, a bit of a tricky city because... You want to study abroad, but on the other side, on the other side, it's one mm -hmm. of the best cities in the world to, to study, especially when you're young. So, yeah. um, I, I decided to do like bachelor's in Lisbon and then to um, to go to Spain for my master's and continue kind of on the same line. So I, I studied finance uh, in Barcelona, also another great city to uh, to study at, uh, and that's really kind of where I, where I first started getting uh, kind of acquainted to uh, kind of the, the the VC ecosystem. I mean, it's always startup something that you you see in the news on Facebook, etc. Uh, but um, uh, not really something that I was so acquainted to. So during the master, I had a couple of courses, etc., and that was, I would say, kind of the first touch point uh, with the industry. Um, then after that, I moved back to Lisbon, um, did kind of a small stint in investment banking, which had always been kind of uh, my idea of what I wanted to do. Uh, I actually quite liked it, uh, the M&A side, asset management, not so much. I thought it was mm -hmm. too many numbers, too impersonal uh, for yeah. my taste. Um, and yeah, then basically, so while I was doing that uh, back in Portugal, uh, I decided I wanted to move to Germany. Uh, and initially, I was actually kind of looking for stuff in the same area. So other investment banking roles, uh, maybe some consulting, which I always kind of thought about, but I've never actually ended up doing anything in the space. Uh, but to much of my surprise, uh, and this was really a shock to me because, I mean, Germany is the biggest economy in Europe, so you would expect... Mm -hmm. I mean, English is English is king there. I mean, you don't even need to, to, to know how to say hello in German or anything. Uh, but I actually researched some data, and it's at least at the time it was something like eighty-five percent of all jobs require German, which I didn't oh, wow. speak at the time. And, and even now, it's still not really uh, not really business uh, heavy. I usually say I'm restaurant fluent, uh, <laughs> so I can order beer, which is the most important thing sure. um, here in Munich. Um, and yeah, so that was kind of really the biggest shock to me, wanting to come to Germany, not mm -hmm. uh, knowing how to speak the local language. And so I really had to start kind of branching out and uh, thinking of alternative career paths. Um, well, tell me about the ecosystem in Spain. So, you know, I would think naturally people would go to London just because in my mind, that's like the closest to being a big city. But I guess, is it London, Germany, any other countries that are kind of the go to big cities for people to maybe get into the investment ecosystem? No, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say, I mean, London, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, London, Germany, and also Milan uh, to some Milan. extent. So, I mean, uh, again, a, a lot of, uh, especially, I mean, not, not just in Spain, but across Spain, Portugal, mm -hmm. uh, most of the foreign students 
actually come from uh, Germany or the Nordic. So I, I remember, I think in my uh, university, for example, I think around one third of them were Germans uh, and another one third were Italians. And then the remaining uh, third were from another 200 countries, you know. So mm -hmm. it was a huge melting pot, but kind of skewed towards uh, those two big uh, countries, which I think kind of helps shape a bit towards um, kind of which ecosystems end up pulling you. Uh, also in terms of kind of university helps, like your low, yeah, the network you build, uh, obviously. I mean, uh, I, I remember I, I was in work groups where I was the only non-German, <laughs> you know. Uh, so these situations end up happening. So I think all, all of these combined, uh, I mean, and, I mean, in Frankfurt alone is kind of, I mean, a huge, uh, I mean, one of the financial hubs, um, certainly in Europe and even in the world. So, um, uh, yeah, it's definitely kind of one of the, the, the three uh, place where people usually go, but, uh, but obviously London, I'd say, is still kind of number one in Europe. Uh, even after Brexit, everything kind of financial related, uh, still probably the number one place where uh, where people want to go and try to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So then you uh, joined, and then you and then you went directly into Blue Future Partners, or did you work at a different firm? Yeah. No. Basically, uh, yeah. That's kind of uh, so. I when I came to Germany, basically, I I moved when I when I joined Blue Future. So uh, again, I yeah. kind of stumbled upon them uh, by accident because again, venture is a, a very global uh, industry uh, yeah. ecosystem. I mean, again, we are based in Munich, uh, just almost by accident. Uh, but uh, I mean, we invest across the world, and even the very few investments we have in Germany. I mean, we are not their only LPs, so uh, all of the commission, the communication, even with our German investments, ends up being in mm -hmm. English. So, uh, and the team, the team as well, it's uh, is very um, kind of very international. Uh, I mean, our two founding partners are German, but they lived, I think, twenty percent of their lives in Germany. Uh, sure. So they are uh, they are kind of quite international themselves. So I think all of that contributes to. Uh, to this international mindset, yeah. And then there's a lot of firms in Luxembourg. Maybe you can, you know, unpack the benefits of Luxembourg. I guess is there, is Luxembourg kind of like the Delaware of of the U.S., where there's just better tax uh, laws and just you know more friendly for venture? Or what's the deal yeah. with Luxembourg? I guess because I've seen a lot of firms that you know they're based somewhere else, but they're like, hey, you know, we're domiciled in Luxembourg. Yeah, so that's actually our case. So we are based. When I say we're based in Germany, it's because they, all of the investment team is in is in Germany, yeah. uh, between Munich and Berlin. But we are, all of our funds uh, are actually domiciled in Luxembourg. So the the GP is yeah. domiciled in Germany, and everything um, everything else is in Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't compare it to Delaware because uh, Delaware has kind of suggested the the tax benefits. Uh, I would say Luxembourg doesn't necessarily have the the tax okay. benefits per se. Uh, it is quite transparent, um, mm -hmm. and uh, because we we handle a lot of kind of family office money, a lot of kind of old money. Uh, I, I think Luxembourg has the event the, the advantage that it's above reproach. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a pain in the ass, and uh, I'm not the right person because I'm not involved in all of the the AML and all of the yeah. bureaucratic side of our company. But I'm happy to do this to our COO, which would spend <laughs> two hours. Uh, going through all the the day the day to day and mm -hmm. the, the, all of the the hassle of uh, going between the like Luxembourg authorities and the German ones, mm -hmm. um, but yeah. So I think that for us it's really uh, you have to do a lot and it's hyper bureaucratical, mm -hmm. but in the end it pays off to go through all of that due diligence and having to everything airtight. It has that advantage that no one can actually point the finger that you are not uh, complying with anything from fiduciary to do to, to AML to anything to the to the highest of standards. So I, I would say Luxembourg is more about the standards mm -hmm. uh, rather than um, rather than any tax breaks. So you do have like tax sure. transparency structures, uh, but you also do get those in Germany, for example. So yeah, uh, yeah whereas it was really, we also have investors from all different countries. So uh, Luxembourg is more international. Uh, rather than a German structure, for example, in terms of experience working with the Asian investors, etc. So, um, yeah, for us, it was really kind of uh, about getting right. all of these things together. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was really helpful. Yeah, I appreciate that. That insight because that was always a question I had. So it sounds like it's just a better trusted standard for family offices, especially if they're putting in money and they just know that you're adhering to the best compliance. Yeah, it's also more expensive. Uh, it's also more expensive okay. to run the structures there. So it's really more about the, yeah. I'd say, the, the safety and the branding. Sure. Type of thing rather than uh, I mean there are of course other advantages but uh, yeah. yeah okay yeah that makes sense um, that was really helpful so okay so then you so you spent some time um, you know really building your career at um, at Blue Future and yeah I guess to clarify that was your first that was your first role right because I saw in your career too you had kind of a stint working in the startup ecosystem as well so did you yeah, um, so 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So in Portugal, I, I was working with like some startups, like some friends, but like uh, that were starting, but never, never, never really officially, more just kind of yeah, semi co-founder type roles. Uh-huh. Uh, and I mean, some of them actually took off uh, and got established, but uh, yeah, I was more kind of advisor role to some startups. So that that's yeah. kind of the first touch point uh, with the ecosystem. Uh, but again, more from the the, the operator uh, side of things. That was for. Yeah, a bit less than a year, a couple of months uh, before I moved to Germany, and then yeah. uh, moving here, kind of the, on the investor side mm-hmm. um, of things. Yeah, yeah, no, that's helpful. And I guess for the the audience that's looking to maybe switch careers or try to be an LP one day, you know, we talk about you know breaking into VC. A lot of times, the best things you can do for breaking into VC is act like a VC before you're a VC, right? So try to source some deals, go to accelerator events. So any advice you have for somebody who wants to be an LP, I guess, is it the same thing? They source some funds and they kind of showcase like the, um, the KPIs of the funds. And if so, like what should they show? Should they show um, kind of like the MOIC or kind of like what they like about the founder? I guess, you know, thinking back to your interview process when you were going to this uh, fund evaluation role, um, any advice you have for, you know, maybe career switchers who want to do that? Yeah, so I mean, I think, first of all, if you are making a career switch, I mean, these are, it's the same ecosystem, but two very different sides. So yeah. first of all, it's important to get acquainted with all of these terms that you were just mentioning, MYC, TVPIs, et cetera, which if you are a founder, you won't necessarily be aware of or won't really care. So I, I'd say that's step number one is make sure that you know kind of the, do like, I mean, fund, funds, uh, VC investing 101 type of thing. And I mean, there's even Investopedia and other source. I mean, there's, I mean, uh, Sutano, obviously, uh, but there's like plenty of uh, kind of online resources on. You guys have been amazing too. I've actually referenced, you know, so if you guys go to Blue Future Partners, you know, your blog has been really great. I think you guys have a post that actually covers like every single, uh, you know, metric and like what it what it. Yeah, means. Yeah, we, we, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We also do that like so very short posts. It's okay, why? What's TVPI? Why is it important? What? Yeah. Does, what kind of readings can you take from it? And so I think this is like just kind of the the base, the top of the funnel yeah. that everyone should. Uh, should have. Then after that, I mean, it's not very not very different from VC in general. So I mean, I'd say building kind of an online presence, uh, and that's something that not everyone is good at. Uh, even yeah. me, I'm still kind of on the on the learning curve there. I mean, I, I was never a big a big fan of Twitter because in Europe, uh, in Europe, it's not really that uh, broadly used as it is in the US. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in VC, it's still uh, kind of the go to social media platform. So. It is important to kind of keep consistent, uh, make smart, small, smart posts, even if it's just reposting someone that's smarter than you. Uh, that always works. But it's important to kind of write, really start building that brand and really kind of sharing mm-hmm. what what you believe in, what 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 are the, the type of things you like, what type of things you are interested in. Really try to get out there uh, per se, uh, and then on the funds more specifically. I mean. Uh, Investing in a VC fund, especially the good ones, it's no different than a, a highly competitive uh, VC round, you know, like a Series A or Series B. Uh, in this sense, it's very important to actually have a network. And if you are, for example, joining, uh, looking to join a company, it's important to know who are the, the, the big names. Do you have a relationship with them? Could you, for example, get help me get an allocation in the fund where I want an allocation in, but I, I was not granted one yet? So all of these types of things end up, all contributing to the to the same uh, to, the, to the same character we know, which is like you need to be mm-hmm. kind of an ecosystem player. Um, and yeah, so it, it doesn't mean obviously if you are not working in industry, you cannot just say, yeah, I, I have a five million access to that fund. But just yeah. the fact that you have a personal connection with the GP, and again, and you can build those uh, uh, using direct messaging on Twitter, for example. I mean, a yeah. lot of these people are very responsive, very friendly. I also have VCs a very kind of niche and small ecosystem where everyone is always very friendly because you can never afford to to trash talk somewhere else because you never know when that, that's going to come back to bite you in the ass. Uh, so I think in general, people are approachable uh, to, to the extent that they have bandwidth to, to reply to uh, to everything. You know, uh, I mean, even me, I have, I mean, hundreds of LinkedIn messages all the time. I, I mean, I try to respond within reason to uh, to as many as possible, but uh, I mean, it's impossible to obviously go through everything. But yeah, I think people are very helpful and collaborative. Um, so yeah, I think just really try to start building that network. Try to uh, try to get yourself out there. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the main, the most important thing. And then of course you have like internships. I mean, we usually always have kind of recurring internship programs. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, 
there are others that do the same. For example, I mean, uh, other other venture people, uh, other other funds of funds like uh, across Europe and in the US as well that have these type of programs. Uh, some of them convert to full time positions, some don't. But even if they don't, it gives you that kind of first access into the industry, and from that you mm -hmm. get acquainted with the industry as a whole. And whether it's because you want to start a company or you want to go to a VC or, or etc., um, you know, you really have it open. You know, I mean, I can give an example of two former colleagues that you've met. That one, uh, they both joined, they both left last year for personal reasons. One to move back to another continent where he's originally from, yeah. and joining a direct VC, a direct VC, and the other because he his life dream was to start a company, and so he joined to to try to start that journey. So. You would think that, yeah, it's not the same job, but it's the same ecosystem. So there are always <laughs> loads that you can take from um, from that, you know? Yeah. And there's always parallels in life. So there's a fund manager in my program that used to be a artist in repertoire for music. And I was, I, he was on my show recently and he's like, yeah, Joel, like VC is just like being an artist in repertoire. You have to find talent and source them. And then hope that they hope that they provide some returns, right? But it's it's completely different industry. So I would say being a VC, kind of sourcing and screening deals, um, it's not too dissimilar from being an LP trying to source and screen funds. Obviously, the KPIs and the metrics are different, um, but you're still trying to find talent and you're still trying to get in early. I would say for fund managers, same thing. You want to get in maybe in their fund one. So that hopefully they stay with you for decades, you know, where, you know, they've really, really matured into an institution where it's like impossible to get in, but they let you in because you back them. You're like one of their day one backers. Um, but like, I'd love for you to maybe dial in a little more on that, you know, the process of, um, of how you guys are sourcing and screening. I see that um, Twitter is a big driver. Like every LP is on Twitter. They may not be public about it. Um, and, um, you know, I know that Twitter is a big thing, but I guess in Europe, what are the other platforms that they're using? I guess, are they just using databases or are they using LinkedIn? Cause you said Twitter's not that popular there. Um, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, I, would say, I mean, Twitter always, um, yeah. I mean, LinkedIn, LinkedIn, I feel is a lot more relevant, uh, mm -hmm. in terms of in Europe, uh, versus yeah. the U S. Uh, so I, I would say again, in both, in both places you use both, but I'd say LinkedIn is for Europe, what Twitter is for, for the U S I'd say we Got use it. a lot of Twitter because we have, I mean, almost half of our portfolio is in the U S. So, uh, mm -hmm. we are very embedded into the, uh, the ecosystem over there. Uh, but yeah, I'd say that, and then it's it's a much smaller ecosystem in a way that so it's much more emerging than in the US. You know, so it's one yeah. of the most established ones globally. But compared to Silicon Valley, for example, it's still emerging by that type of uh, standard. So it means that there are a lot of people kind of on the same playing level playing field, which means that people are. I mean, some people are more competitive, of course, like in everything yeah. in life. But you also do see a lot of people just genuinely trying to help each other out. So if you look, for example, yeah. into the female founders and female uh, investors and entrepreneurial um, space, which I'd say in Europe really became kind of a hot topic about three years ago. That's when we really noticed a lot of more female female focused funds popping up, a lot more female founded companies popping up uh, and all of that. And you really see that using that as an example, it's an incredibly tight uh, network and ecosystem. So of course they all want to be as, as good as they can be, but they also want the ecosystem as a whole to, to thrive and to, to grow, uh, to have that positive that positive impact, you know? So, uh, and that can really be said about, I'd, I'd say, European general. You do have some more established people that might uh, have a bit more of that, uh, yeah, I build the ecosystem type of mentality. I don't, I don't need to, uh, I don't need to play fair. I can, I, I can do uh, just fine on my own, but yeah, I mean, especially long-term, that's no way yeah. to go. Uh, in general, you know, um, and again, they will just be outpaced by by someone else that does have that more kind of complementary um, approach. Because even if you are a lead investor, you, you always need someone to fill in the rest of the round. You know, and oh, you yeah. might as well that you value and that you know that can add value, bring value to the table, rather than just some random people that uh, uh, that just got access to the deal. You know. Yeah, I mean, you you want to always, you know I always think about this. You know, your upstream and downstream investors, right? Because there may be upstream investors where the deals are too big for them. So that's like perfect for your size, but then some of the deals just come on your table that are like, Oh, wow. You know, you should talk to this fund because they're um, you know, they're, they're more in your stage. So I think complimentary 
uh, investors is super helpful. I mean, for me, just kind of building the community is what really supported um, all of my access to things and even even getting invited to really cool events and 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 other platforms that I didn't have access to. So I think there's a lot of benefits with being complimentary. And a lot of times you just can't, you know, own everything. Right. So I think if you can just kind of piggyback off of someone else that's that's hosting an event or doing something and you can kind of um, support that, then that kind of helps you build your footprint. You know, for example, like next week, there's, you know, one of our one of our graduates is coming in and uh, we're both kind of, you know, kind of doing a happy hour together. And, and I think the fact that we got so many people to sign up, it's not if I did it myself, I don't think that many people would show up. So I think if you can kind of combine audiences and communities together, I think you can really build a, a bigger footprint together as well. So I'm totally, totally, totally of the collaborative mindset. But you're right. There are some people that are like, you know, they have sharp elbows and, and super competitive. And a lot of times, you know, that could be. That could kind of go against them, too. Um, I, I guess, you know, for me, you know, it'd be really interesting. And I think even for the audience, for emerging fund managers, what are some things that they should know um, as far as kind of what what you're excited about? So maybe you can tell me, you know, obviously you talked about the social footprint, creating really valuable content because um, that attracts founders. What are some other things that really excite you about funds when you're investing in them? What are, what are kind of the top things that you look for? Yeah, I mean, so I think. A bit, a bit like looking at a, a, star, a startup. I mean, like the most important thing uh, will always be the the GP, whether it's a solo GP or, or if it's a, mul a multiple partner uh, partnership. The the team is, I, I'd say, I mean, it's the bread and butter of this business. Ultimately, you need to you're going to be in business with these people for ten to fifteen years. I mean, this this expression gets thrown around almost every single day. But like uh, the, the the average GPLP relationship does last longer than the average marriage. So. Uh, yeah. So you, you really need to enjoy spending time with the people that you are in business with. You know, it's not it, it just doesn't get it to generate profits and returns because, I mean, there's plenty of ways to generate money, whether it's other asset classes, same asset class, different people like you won't capture just because of that. So you need to find the right fit on a, on, on a personal level and you, you really need to believe uh, kind of that the person you are backing is the right person for the job, you know, and that's why we like to partner up with kind of early teams. Uh, and uh, so we usually invest for the first time between fund one and fund three. That's kind of usually our uh, our sweet spot for the, the first ticket. Then obviously we continue uh, investing uh, mm -hmm. later on. Also, to the point of you were saying about the allocations, obviously, again, if these funds stay true to their strategy and don't scale too much, they are, I don't know, 150 million and they, they stay 150 million. So there, and if, the, if these people, if these funds are good, people won't drop out in theory. So that yeah. means that you won't you won't be able to scale at least significantly your, your allocation. Let alone mm -hmm. if you're an, as an outsider coming to the fund. So that's really important to build that relationship early to to kind of gain that access. You know, um, and then of course, I mean, the people that are really just starting, even if they come out of a new fund, uh, an established fund like Sequoia or uh, Benchmark or, or Bessemer, or whatever it may be. It's always a new experience for them, you know. It's a change of a ch change of strategy, a change of heart. You left you left a, a comfortable job as a partner at Sequoia. You did it for a reason, you know. So I mean, it's because you want to pursue something that will make you happier, or that you want to see that as your retirement job, you know. Uh, that's an, another expression that you, that we see thrown around very often. That this is this is the the place where I'm going to retire. And and you see people in, on their 35s, early 40s saying this, you know. So. Mm -hmm. uh, so this really shows you need to be committed for the long run. Uh, and for us, it's really important to really kind of be able to assess that, you know, to to see that spark in uh, in, the, in the teams uh, and really want to be part of that journey, you know. And then, of course, of course, it needs to make sense. OK, I want to invest in deep tech and I in deep tech focus on B2B and I, I come from a consumer background. OK, maybe that's not the right thing for you to do. Maybe you should think something else. But. So again, things need to, what you want to do needs to make sense and kind of like you need to play to your strengths. Uh, but I would say that personal connection uh, is ultra, ultra important. And, and we've dropped names that, of funds that were, by all standards, performing uh, very yeah. well, like top decile, top quartile, uh, like even top decile funds that we dropped by different reasons. Either the, the, team, the team fell apart or, uh, again, our relationship with them was not... We didn't felt it, you know, it, it's a bit subjective, I, I know, but it, it, it yeah. is a bit of a subjective uh, type of thing, you know. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, so the best analogy I've heard now, we still say this, it's, um, 
it's like choosing your your significant other you know so there's yeah. only so much analysis you can do yeah you know they um <laughs> they have some bad hap you know because you can do like a pros and cons right if you want to <laughs> if you want to date somebody you know oh you know i like brunettes you know they have blonde hair so that's a con um you know so there's only so many like qualitative and quantitative things that you can put down on a chart but at the end you're going to choose right so you're going to despite all those pros and cons um, you know, you invest in who you choose at the end of the day. I don't know if that makes sense, but like, I feel like that's kind of a similar um, analogy. I mean, completely. And I mean, in, in recent years, I'd say in the last three years, I mean, the, ecos the, the ecosystem became so crowded of new funds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, again, this is something that I see in the next two years will probably shrink a bit because a lot of these funds, I, I believe, will struggle to raise follow-on capital uh, yeah. for their, uh, their follow-on vehicles. Uh, due to the current market sentiment, uh, but that's a different topic. Uh, but yeah, it, it really helps. So you have like hundreds and hundreds of new funds, many of them targeting the same profile of founders, many of them coming from the exact same uh, Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook, whatever uh, company. So the same network, very similar experience, similar track record, trying to do the same thing. So it, it ultimately will do, okay, which of the, these two people will pull it off? You know, it's, it, it, it really is as simple as that, you know. Uh... Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think there's um, so you, that that's why people optimize for that choosing factor. Right. So it's kind of like at the end of the day, all these funds are great. All the GPs, they went to, you know, Harvard. Many of them are like X Google, X Dropbox, X Slack. So they have, you know, product experience from Silicon Valley. They've already gotten to their first close through all the other. Uh, founders in the ecosystem as um, as initial LPs. So at the end of the day, it's really just kind of optimizing for like how you feel um, to to actually decide to invest. I guess right. Yeah. So again, that's I mean, kind of yeah. No, so I was, and again, and, and obviously this is very important. But I mean, the, the the actual quantitative side, like the track record, all of that. I mean, obviously this is something that people should not just ignore completely. I mean, it is a very important yeah. thing, and it does play a huge role in terms of like skimming through um, kind of the, the funnel. Uh, and I think on the track record side, I think it's very often a, a term that kind of scares first time, uh, first time GPs, especially the mm -hmm. ones that that uh, are coming from uh, an operator role or, or a startup role rather than uh, another VC. Yeah. Uh, I mean, track record is just a, a word. It, it really can mean anything. Obviously, if you have five funds with 5X plus mm -hmm. and 200 million deployed, I mean, great, you know. Uh, but track record can be anything from, I mean, your founder experience, like uh, your roles, even not as a founder, your operator role at uh, Dropbox or Airtable or whatever it may be, uh, to the founder and even angel investments that you've that you've done. I mean, or crowdfunding. I mean, this doesn't have to be a five million angel portfolio. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've literally seen people with, I don't know, a couple of hundred k uh, worth of uh, angel portfolio, which I understand is already a lot of money, but still, um, and that. In context, okay, this amount, this 100k or whatever, was 80% of their net worth. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's really not just about the the numbers. It's about okay, why did you choose that company, uh, and why the, why that company? How did you met them? How did you source them? Okay, I, you, I understand you put 5k because that was the money you had, but uh, could you have done better? Could you have done different? How 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 is your relationship with that founder? So all of these things matter. Um, and again, I, I think a lot of GPs feel intimidated by it, and they shouldn't. So they, yeah. they should especially not try to kind of sweep it under the rug. Uh, I think it's if you don't have a track record, it's much better to just be upfront about it. And okay, why don't I have a track record? Why am I now starting to build my track record? Why is this pilot fund uh, my kind of proof of concept? So it's much better to be just upfront about it rather than mm -hmm. just kind of oh, I forgot to put the slide and you, you just think that people won't notice that, that it's not there, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Well, let's double click a little more on the quantitative metrics. I think this would be helpful for emerging managers and, you know, it'd be just good to kind of see your evaluation framework. So as you're evaluating, um, you know, maybe fund one, but let's talk about fund one. What are some of the things that you look for? So I think the track record is a great example because that, you know, establishes and showcases their ability to source and screen. Uh, really great deals. So, you know, I, I always, you know, in our program, um, one, one of the things I have the fund manager showcase is like, hey, what is your hottest deal that you're proud of? Because people judge you based on your deal flow. So I think that's a good point. What are some of the other metrics on the quantitative side that you 
like to look at? You talked about TVPI, MOIC. Um, so yeah. any, and then, and then maybe what another LP in the past has mentioned also uh, looking at their financials, like how they're managing uh, their money. So when they go through the diligence, looking at their, you know, their income statement and saying, Hey, you know what, how are they using their management fees? So maybe there's some other things, you know, just across the, over the years that you've um, just kind of used as a good metric and, and seen as a common pattern um, mm -hmm. on the quantitative side, maybe you can talk through those. Yeah, so I, mean, I think the, the key three metrics in terms of track record in general, it's, as you mentioned, kind of the MYC, the TVPI, and the DPI. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, these are definitely kind of the, the key three, and they speak for themselves. Um, yeah. We personally, uh, I mean, me personally and BFP in general, like, we don't necessarily are big fans of IRR because it's used incorrectly. Yeah. I mean, so this, this comes from a, the PE world, and, and it's used incorrectly in venture. I mean, if you talk to me about IRR on DPI, then by all means. But what happens very often is people talk about net IRR or gross IRR or whatever, assuming that the money, okay, let me just do a X IRR on Excel, put all the money coming in now. And that number doesn't really tell you anything. And I think a lot of people learned that over the past 12 months where they saw 50% IRRs being shrank to 10% uh, due to the uh, kind of the, the adjustment in the valuations. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, so this is, it, it's also a very commonly used one that again i think it's incorrectly used that personally I, I completely ignore it I, I mean i don't mind having it on a deck or not my brain will just completely look past it uh because again i, I don't, there's no reading no reasonable reading that i can take from that number other than it's just kind of puff and i mean yeah it's nice to have a 50 percent error but it doesn't really tell you anything concrete mm -hmm. you know um so that's yeah the banking kind of a, a commonly used one as well uh i'd say the the, the, the other set of quantitative aspects that we look at, it's kind of like portfolio construction and kind of everything that comes with it. So we, we, we focus a lot on the portfolio construction side. Uh, personally, I prefer kind of more concentrated portfolios uh, where the GPs actually have time to have kind of a hands-on approach and really add value to the company. So this is something between, I don't know, 20 and 30, like 35, whatever it may be. Uh, portfolio companies, there's no right number. Uh, there's no right or wrong there. Uh, we also have some portfolio funds that have larger portfolios. Uh, so again, mm -hmm. the more important thing is that your portfolio strategy needs to work for you. And if you tell me that your strategy is to deliver 5x returns doing 50k tickets out of a 30 million fund in 100 companies, then by and, and you can back it up, then by all means, you know, yeah. uh, I'm not telling you that you're wrong or uh, or anything like that. Um, yeah, so with yes. 30 companies, um, I'm, I'm assuming the average check size is like 150 to 250 is kind of what you're seeing normally. Sorry? It's like, no, I mean, I'm just kind of thinking about the check size. So if you're doing like yeah. 20 to 30 companies, right, and it's concentrated, we're probably looking at at least like a 250K to 300K check size to kind of maybe back into like a 10 to $20 million fund, yeah, I'm assuming, I mean right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it, depending on the size of the fund and the strategy, yeah. uh, it, I'd say usually goes from, yeah, like 250 up to like 3 mm -hmm. million. Yeah. Uh, depending if it's kind of a lead, uh, kind of a, let's say 150, 200 million fund leading rounds, yeah. et cetera. So, uh, on one end of the spectrum and on the other one, yeah, more like the 10 to 30 million fund uh, kind of participating or co maybe leading a couple of pre seeds, mm -hmm. uh, something like that. So, yeah, so we, we focus only on early social pre seeds series I. So, that's kind of why. Have you seen different check sizes for, like, I guess when, you know, maybe you can walk through kind of some of the best portfolio constructions that you've seen. But I've also seen just kind of looking at the portfolio construction, um, some of the seed checks are obviously smaller, right? So, sometimes they're like, 150 to 250 and then obviously if it's a series a it could be like 500k to a million so any any best practices on just kind of the the check size is based on the number of investments um as you're building a portfolio and it, you know and again you know i know there's so many different combinations but anything that you've seen as far as kind of um uh maybe a case study or a benchmark or maybe just an yeah. example yeah, I mean, I would say it's not kind of one 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 size fits all, you know. Yeah. So uh, again, it ultimately needs to make sense for you. Yeah. Uh, so again, to give a couple of examples, I mean, actually a very standard case is obviously let's say a, a larger fund, let's say mm -hmm. your hundred million fund um, that leads seed rounds, and they usually put like let's say yeah between one and three million to lead the round, and they take uh, ten to fifteen percent ownership or or a bit more. Uh, yeah. And then they build the syndicate, etc. So they are like the the big kahuna, the, the guy leading mm -hmm. the round and setting the terms, etc. Uh, and again, this makes sense for a lot of people. 
Uh, and then on the other side, you also have people where, for example, uh, they are betting on their access, not necessarily their firepower, but the access to hyper contested deals. Uh, where sometimes, uh, and this is another, another example that I think is very successful as well, which peop, um, a fund that we're invested in, they usually do uh, smaller ticket sizes. So let's say yeah, 200, uh, like 100 to 300 K or something uh, in a pre-seed or a seed uh, with the goal, again, because they get that access and uh, then they build on the relationship with the founder to invest meaningfully in the, the next round. So. Mm -hmm. At this scale, we are not talking about prorata because, I mean, the prorata on a 300k check would maybe be, I don't know, a couple of hundred k's. This is really okay. I invest 300k and I prove to you that I am so helpful that you want me to have more skin in the game. So you want you want me to put two, three, four, five million in my Series A or Series B, mm -hmm. regardless of what prorata, super prorata, regardless of what the model says. You want me to put a, a meaningful chunk of the round. Uh, because you want me more engaged. So this is a different strategy where that can also work brilliantly. So that, that's what I'm saying. There's no right or wrong. Yeah. It's really you need to play to yourself. Because I always say for this type of approach, it's very different to tell like Sequoia or uh, yeah. Union Square, okay, can I get the 100K worth of that round because I am mm -hmm. this much valuable? And they really generally say yes, because they recognize yeah. that value bringing you on. Then to say, yeah, can you please step aside? This is my show now. So mm -hmm. these are very different dynamics you know and you need to yeah. to know how to play uh, to your strengths you know so take a, take a small step in and then if you really believe in your value well then you have nothing to worry about you know yeah uh, so yeah i'll say these are the two extremes in terms of the the approaches and then obviously there's the, the kind of the, the growing fund where maybe you go from one end and you all grow are growing into becoming kind of that lead partner so you mm -hmm. you, you start co-leading a few you you are very collaborative uh so there you usually see some discrepancy between yeah, the other 200k up to like one or 1.5 million. So you might maybe lead one or two rounds and then you co-lead another one or two and then you participate. And then mm -hmm. in the next phase, you build that brand that, oh, these are not just kind of small tickets. These guys can actually lead rounds. Yeah. And you start building that brand awareness within the ecosystem so that founders also know that they can count on you to lead the rounds. And then again, this, this is something that takes time to build over Kind of the different funds that uh, that you're raising and deploying uh but yeah so again you need to take your time uh again if you come from an angel portfolio writing 10k tickets and you say yeah i'm now gonna lead rounds investing three to four million i mean i'm not saying you cannot do it yeah but the odds are definitely stacked against you you know because sure yeah it, it takes time to, to 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 change people's minds uh and to to get kind of the, to that to that level yeah, no, I agree. Any advice on just um, reserves? So, you know, obviously the reserves are going to be different for a $15 million fund all the way to a $100 million fund. So any best practices or just kind of frameworks that the fund should think about as they're trying to decide how much they should yeah. reserve for follow-on capital? I've seen yeah, anywhere so from like 20% to, to like 40% in, um, in reserves. So. Yeah, so I would say the most common range is probably between 40 and 60% reserves. Yeah. Again, depending on fund size, strategy, kind of all, all of these things. But I would say that's kind of where the bulk of funds end up. Uh, I mean, there are, of course, a few funds that have a specific strategy that they hold 0% in reserves. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's kind of uh, as a specific strategy, not related to the fund size or, or anything like that. Um, but again, for smaller funds, it's tougher to have a meaningful part in reserves. Uh, yeah. I always advise funds to try to keep a, a, at least 20%, even if you are a 15 million fund or something. Yeah. Uh, the reason for that is because as you scale the fund size, you will obviously also have to scale the, the, res, the reserve side, uh, side you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a great proof of concept to show that you were actually able to identify your winners from the portfolio. Because the fact that we very often see, I mean, you invested in 20, 30 companies and then you actually did a terrible, terrible job allocating the reserves. And you actually double and triple down on the companies that actually ended up going bust. And the ones that are the unicorns of the portfolio, they had the, the initial ticket and maybe a tiny, tiny bit on top or something by accident. So yeah. this, is something, this is something that we always look uh, when, when diligencing a fund, okay, how much was deployed in reserves? Um, okay, these are the winners. How much of the reserves was concentrated on the winners? Uh, as a way to really try to assess, was this a, a thoughtful and a meaningful decision? Or were they just kind of allocating X, uh, kind of the same amount to every company, and obviously then some go up, some go down, etc. Or was this really kind of a strategy? Uh, 
and, and in some of our funds, we actually seen that that, uh, for example, as much as 80% or so of the reserves were allocated to the top three, four companies of the portfolio. So this tells me that from the very early stages, like the Series A, Series B latest, these, these people knew exactly how big this company could be. I mean, maybe not how big as it became, but they knew that this, this, was, this was the place where they should be putting the money. And of, of yeah. course, this doesn't always work. Um, and that's something that we always try to assess as well. Uh, I mean, you mentioned that very rightfully that uh, probably the most common question is, okay, can you tell me, can tell me more about your best uh, company, best performing company? <laughs> the one thing that we always like to do is actually, can you tell me about your worst performing company or the yeah. one where you lost the money? And why did that happen? I mean, it's not that I'm calling you them or anything. I mean, it's normal. I mean, if you don't lose money, it's because you're not taking enough chances. It's more about what went wrong. Did you learn? What did you learn from it? Would you do it again? And again, I'm not looking for some guy that tells me, oh, yeah, this was great for to learning. I would never do it again. No, no, no. It's totally fair to yeah. say I would do this again because the reason why this ended up going uh, zero was X, Y, Z. And yeah. that's totally you know so what i want to know is that you actually took something out of it you know that you just didn't burn the money that you actually mm -hmm. learned something and it doesn't matter if you put a lot of money there as initials as reserves whatever it may be it's about kind of the the learning process and really understanding the reason that left that that led to that outcome because we also very often see okay the, your biggest win was an accident and that also happens yeah. you oh, oh why where did you source this deal why did you invest in this deal Oh, I invest because they are the market. Yeah, okay, but when they were at pre-seed, they weren't. So mm -hmm. uh, this was not an obvious case then. So if it, if this wasn't an obvious case, why did you do it? Did you know what you were doing, or it was just one out of the pack? You know. So these type of things are are, are uh, things that we, we we really try to get to the bottom of, and really mm -hmm. try to understand the reasons to invest, not just the sourcing channels, but really okay, what led you to build? Was it the founder? Uh, was it their uh, pretty blue eyes? Was it the, you, you know, was it the strategy, the market size? There has to be something that drove you to, that that made you passionate enough to to actually uh, invest in that company, you know. And, and so that's really what we're uh, always looking for when looking into the kind of the line by line uh, of the track record, um, anti portfolios, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, whatever it may be, you know. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Um, let's talk about reups. So both sides, how should the GPs think about re-ups and positioning re-ups with their existing LPs? And then, um, and then I guess, how do you guys look at re-ups as well? You know I mean? And I've heard a lot of feedback from um, a lot of LPs, you know, a lot of times, look, it's, it's less work to just re-up if the fund is working and, you know, at the portfolio level of the, of the LP, um, if, if it's kind of helping in their, their strategy, a lot of times it's much easier to re-up. So just wanted to hear your take or just general reactions to re-ups and, and, yeah. and just advice on both sides. Yeah, absolutely. the most common thing in terms of, I mean, not, not us per se, but like from what I hear from endowments, I mean, large US fund of fund centers, like re-ups tend to take priority. So all things like Ceteris Paribus, going back to my economy days, the re-up takes because it's someone that you've known, you know, so it's you're not yeah. going into the unknown. So I'd say this is kind of this holds true for for everyone in uh, in, in general. Uh, and by saying this, this is also the main risk and the main challenge for uh, a fund of funds to really kind of outperform its peers is to really mm -hmm. okay. be able to show some cold blood. And just because something is working doesn't mean that by re-upping in something that is working, you are not missing out on something great. Yeah. Uh, and so I think this is the toughest thing for an LP is to really, okay, I like this guy. I love having dinner with them. I, I enjoy going out. I enjoy our coffees, our chats, our Zooms, etc. But I need to drop it because I think they are becoming too comfortable or they became too large or whatever reason it might be, you know, mm -hmm. and need to go with something where I see more potential. So I, I think this is the biggest challenge. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it's something that we are faced every day. And I mean, every, every LP is faced every day. Mm -hmm. uh, so you really need to be very aware uh, of this kind of unconscious or almost conscious bias that, that exists. Yeah. Um, yeah, for us, for the RIPs, I mean, we, we always do the same level of due diligence um, in terms of, uh, I mean, the only thing we might become a bit lighter on is in terms of uh, references. We always do at least couple of references but obviously i mean if it's someone that we've invested for the fourth time i mean it's almost like i mean 
it's like I am I am the reference, you know, like other people do references with me, not, <laughs> you know. Uh, so that's kind of the only thing. Other than that, it's really more about uh, try to be aware for partnership dynamics, changes in strategy, changes in fund size, uh, all of these things that what was working in the past, I mean, if you're changing it even slightly, that means it might not work in the future. So we need to be very aware of kind of changes on, on the portfolio construction side, uh, again, fun side, team dynamics, bringing in new people, uh, having some people leave. Um, all of those things um, kind of play play a much larger role than uh, kind of, yeah, just talking with founders, et cetera, uh, for, for uh, the re-ups. Uh, I think one advice for especially uh, early uh, emerging managers that are maybe raising their second fund is uh, very often GPs fall into the kind of the, 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 um, the mistake of becoming too transactional, uh, which is you basically only try to interact when you need something or when you want something. Or I mean, it has happened to me. I can give examples of people that I wasn't investing in, but I, I want to keep an open communication line because I, I maybe want to invest in their second fund or something. Yeah. And I'm visiting their city and I'm, hey, I'm in town. Do you want to grow a coffee? Like, no strings attached. I, I'm... I mean, I'm not. I, I know you're not raising. I, I, I yeah. don't want to shove money down your throat. Like, let's just get to know each other better. And people say, "Oh no, I'm not raising now." I was like, mm. I mean, it's like, uh, yeah, very, that's like, yeah, that's like emotional intelligence 101. Like, I think just kind of yeah, building exactly. building a relationship. People people want to at the end of the day build invest in their friends, right? And I mean, it, it's probably safe to say that everybody that you invested in, you've kind of built somewhat of a friendship. You might have even gotten to know their family. So I think that's just kind of like, hey, you know what, there's an LP that possibly could be an investor down the road. Um, just build a friendship with that person. You, and you never know. And you never know how they could help you and build some goodwill, right? There's probably something that you need help with. Um, and, um, and, you know, just kind of that, that support for each other, I think goes a long way. But I, I guess, you know, look, I mean, and this leads to my next question, right? I mean, there, there's people that are under pressure, uh, they're like, look, look, Rodrigo, I'm only going to take a coffee with you if you can write a check. Um, you know, so I think that I think some of these external pressures might have put pressure on people, too. Right. So maybe you can talk a little bit about what you've seen in the last uh, maybe two to three weeks. Um, you know, I mentioned to you offline, you know, I've heard from an LP that some people are, you know, they haven't seen any capital calls since um, that that instant. So any any kind of observations or things that you've been seeing. I, I, I would say in the last year, uh, many of the funds that have kind of gone through my platform um, have taken a haircut. So they, they came in, they're like, look, you know what, we're, we're doing an $80 million fund. Um, and then, you know, kind of when it's time to join the program, it's like, hey, yeah, just an update. Like we're down to 40. So I would say two, two insights for me is kind of like, look, no capital calls in the last couple of weeks. And then um, just in the last year, I've seen people cut from anywhere from 35 to 50 percent on their their AUM. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I think uh, a lot of funds that raised in 2021, for example, uh, are actually oversized. And, and I've also heard this from some of our portfolio managers and from uh, people from the ecosystem that they feel large and they feel big, you know, because these funds were raised for a, a, a market where seed rounds were, I don't know, 15 million or something, you know, yeah. and, and now they're back to, I don't know, two or three. Uh, yeah. So um, the funds are massively mismatching the market now, uh, similar to how they were maybe like in late 2019, early 2020, where it was the opposite. So rounds grew much, much quicker than, um, much faster than, than the fund sizes. So I think now you see the, the other uh, side of the coin. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of these funds that raised in 2021 um, would actually just go back to LPs and say, uh, I mean, actually, a Founders Fund publicly announced that they were breaking up their, their fund into fund eight or nine or something like that. So they were taking 50% of the money and calling it their, their next fund already. So I, I think I, I wouldn't be surprised if this becomes a bit more common um, in the industry that people get realize that, okay, if I do deploy this money, and of course, you can always spend the money, you are going to be taking a hit on performance which can hurt you long term. So I think it's about yeah. kind of the versus short term perspective there. Um, I don't know if you saw the news. There was a post with uh, from Vibe Capital. So I think they were like a $70 million fund. And the founder also has a company as well, like a, a fintech company. So he was operating a fintech company and also raising a $70 million fund. And then he posted 
uh, why he's cutting down the fund to 40%. I think also he wanted to kind of be focused on um, his portfolio company, which was, uh, that's an interesting beast, right? Because it's it's a lot of work enough in itself to kind of run a fund, but also to run like a, a venture back startup. That's a whole other job. Um, but, you know, he, you know, obviously for obvious reasons, it makes sense that he cut that. Um, but, you know, there's also just market conditions that are driving that, you of know, so people. Yeah. So I think the people were who were who were suiting up for the market that they expected, you know, all these events kind of made them take that that haircut. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of people also make the mistake that I think it's in 2020, 20, uh, 2022, a lot of people were forced to take that haircut because it was OK, either close here or I mean, there's there's such a thing as too many extensions on the fundraising period, you know. Yeah. Um, and so I think a lot of people were pushed to, to that because, I mean, second half of the year, very, very few people were actually allocating money. Uh, I, I know of very, very few people that invest. And this was not just on the LP side, but even the GPs. I mean, I know of some very brief kind of franchise names that did like, I don't know, one or two uh, Series A investments where in the previous year they've done, I don't know, 60. So uh, everyone was kind of like putting the, the foot on the brakes uh, in the industry. Um, and, I, but, and I think so, some people just, okay, took the hit. Okay, let me, let me close it as it is. Let me, let me work with what I got and build the kick-ass fund, whether it's 40 instead of 70 or whatever. But I think some people make the mistake that they continue raising that fund. Uh, and it's okay if you raise for one, two years. I mean, mm -hmm. it's fine. But if you come to me and you say that you're, you've been in the market for like almost four years now. Wow. I mean, the, the thing is, there is no real incentive or advantage for me to even consider that fund. So if I, if I would have considered it in the beginning and I said, mm -hmm. no, let's engage for the next fund, you would have been much better off closing the fund and then coming back to me now with a new well, fund. It throws off all of your portfolio construction and your your strategy, right? Because it kind of dissolves like a concentrated portfolio is going to be a different strategy than a, you know, obviously a 70, you know, 70 company investing firm. Um, so I think that, you know, to, on top of what you're saying, I think just the numbers kind of get skewed as well, right? Because yeah, you're, sure. yeah, so you're, you're, yeah, your no, strategy is going to be different. I mean, as an LP, if you see someone approaching you, with the fully a fully built portfolio, where like I don't know, twenty out of twenty five companies, that's essentially a, a fully built portfolio. Yeah. I mean, there is no incentive to invest because you, you okay, you see the underlines, but they're all very early to properly mm -hmm. assess. Yeah. But you also don't have kind of that risk, so you can already make assessments. Okay, do I like? Oh, I, I like this one. Mm, I don't like this one. This one is not so interesting. Oh, this one is in. So you do start. You you start cherry picking which companies you like and which ones mm -hmm. you don't. You know. And if you compare, for example, with a secondary uh, transaction, like so buying secondaries of an LP that wants uh, earlier liquidity from uh, another VC fund, mm -hmm. I mean, there I see the portfolio, like the portfolio is more mature and I get the benefit of buying at a discount and getting the early liquidity. So a fully constructed early stage portfolio is kind of a riskier secondary. So, you know, it doesn't really have place in most of people's portfolios. So, yeah. and I think this is a mistake that very a lot of people run into. Uh, and I think you need to know when to stop, close it as as is, and then just just raise the other one after twelve months instead of three years. You know, it's it's totally fine. Yeah. It's better to do that rather than just dragging along the the entire process. Yeah. So I know we're at two minutes. So I want to do some. Uh, I want to do two more quick questions to get us to the end of the. Uh, the, uh, the podcast here, but, you know, any, you know, so we talked about 2022, we talked about 2021, you know, what are some observations or just um, things that you're mindful of after just kind of the last two to three weeks, you know, have you seen any kind of notable things that you're kind of keeping close watch around and, you know, just as far as the fund ecosystem and as far as just kind of investing in stars, but most like, most importantly, just kind of the fund activity. Have you seen any funds kind of put a pause on their fundraise and, rethink their strategy or um, that would be kind of interesting to hear your take on that. And then, um, yeah. Yeah. So I'd say 2020, second half of 2022, uh, I would say it was a bit like ice age per se. So very, very few uh, people successfully raised. I mean, there were a couple that uh, very successfully raised. Uh, and again, if you are good, you, you will be good in any market conditions. Uh, yeah. but the market as a whole, I think struggled. Um, I think in 2023, again, excluding the kind of, past three weeks, um, I've been seeing a lot more activity. Uh, I'd say quality of the deal flow. Uh, so the quality, the average quality of VCs that are fundraising now uh, massively improved compared to the past uh, six to nine months. Um, 
uh, from what I've spoken with other LPs, people are genuinely like looking forward to allocate again, to deploy again. Uh, I think a, a big issue of 2022 as well was that people deployed insanely in the first quarter. Yeah. Uh, so I think I, I feel like I, I remember I was in December 2021 uh, in the US. And when I came back, I, I remember like in our first kind of investment meeting, hey guys, just FYI, I think two thirds of our US portfolio is coming back to market in about three, five months or so. So, and this I think really kind of mirrors how the ecosystem was. And this was shared by, I mean, endowments, large mm -hmm. US players, et cetera, from uh, kind of uh, peer, peers, et cetera, that really everyone kind of felt the same. Everyone over allocated in the beginning mm -hmm. of the year so had to kind of like take the foot out of, out of the accelerator throughout the second half and really kind of be mindful of the capital. Again, we also have fundraising cycles. We have deployment periods, whether it's a budget per year or uh, kind of a fund size, et cetera. You do need to be mindful of how, how you spend it and when you spend the money. Uh, and I think 2022, again, it was very skewed towards the, the early months of the year. Uh, again, 2023, sentiment changed. I see more, more people... Uh, more activity, uh, again, more interesting things. People are kind of showing more optimism. Mm -hmm. uh, optimism about the future, not so much in 33. I think 2023 yeah. still will be kind of an adjustment year. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say second half of the year, you maybe might start seeing again uh, kind of an opening of the IPO market, maybe two or three or something, some, some brave people that decide to test the waters. Uh, but I would say 2024 will really be kind of the, the year to, to business as usual, in the sense of like excluding kind of the spike uh, in, in valuations, et cetera, but really continuing the trend that we've been coming from 2019, 2020 uh, and, and all of that. So I think it will be kind of the, the kind of the going back to normality mm -hmm. uh, uh, year. Uh, and yeah, and this year I think will be an adjustment again from, tra we've been traveling a lot more. Uh, so I definitely see a lot of optimism in emerging markets, uh, yeah. et cetera. So people are kind of excited, interesting things, new founders. Uh, yeah, to your point as well, I mean, I think the whole kind of Silicon Valley um, uh, bank uh, shutdown will basically, uh, yeah, it, it scared a couple of people. We even got people that had called capital saying, yeah, don't, don't pay the capital call. Just take your time. We, we, we reconsider. We don't need the money. Keep it. Uh, yeah. And so we, and, and we, I also think that we haven't received any capital calls. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe we got one or two, mm -hmm. but uh, at least okay. out of mind, uh, none that I recall. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think people are kind of taking their time to really kind of readjust a bit, uh, sure. see how this is going to impact uh, kind of the markets, et cetera. And then at the portfolio company level, how have you seen the, um, the valuations? Have you seen some, you know, good opportunities to get into deals at like uh, better valuations in last year? So um, do you think that kind of stimulates some of the opportunity as well that, you know, you're getting yeah. like uh, maybe a, maybe a $30 million company, you know, in the seed stage for maybe like 15, 20, like, is there a little bit of a discounted activity in terms of just kind of the price point that you can get into as a result of yeah. all this? Yeah, definitely. Say especially okay. at the growth, I mean, at the growth stage, I think there's no yeah. doubt of that. Mm -hmm. At the early stages, it hasn't been that big of a correction. I mean, it has corrected yeah. a bit, but not so much. I, I would say more on in terms of the round sizes, mm -hmm. rather than valuations per se. I think if you are, again, if you are a good company, people will still price you at, yeah. at whatever they think is fair. Uh, but yeah, we definitely saw a couple of corrections. I, I think in the summer last year, a lot of the funds were taking an approach of, yeah, I'm not investing until the dust, the dust settles a bit. And we also saw the other side of the coin, which was funds coming up to us. Man, I, I'm seeing, better and more deal flow that I have ever seen. Should I stop investing? Because yeah. I really want to invest even more than I was investing in the past because I see great opportunities, more than I'm used to, and at better pricing. So, and I was like, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Uh, you know, so these were kind of, I'd say that the two sides, definitely more, mm -hmm. uh, more, most of the market went to the, let's take our time and see where things are headed. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, definitely this year, especially on the secondary market, uh, a lot of kind of uh, good opportunities on the growth front because we mm -hmm. also do that. Uh, we also do co-investments with our GP, so we've also been looking uh, actively into kind of the secondary markets. Um, I think the, the most common question I've been asked by, by our portfolio is really, uh, because it's also kind of probably the most common question we've been asking like last quarter was, uh, I mean, how many down rounds have you experienced? How much stuff are you marking down? So, I, I, and the, the question was, I mean, I'm doing this and that. What should I be doing? How am I marking enough or not? I think this was kind of the most common mm -hmm. thing I was asked. At that point, I think everyone kind of understood that they, they should mark stuff down. 
no one yeah. really knew about Match. And I've, I've literally seen for the exact same company uh, from two portfolio funds and uh, and two funds that we were in diligence who were looking at the data room, one company that went from as little as a 25% uh, markdown to a uh, 70% markdown. So, I mean, okay, yeah. the company should clearly be marked down, but it, it really, sh- and these are all smart people, you know, so it really shows mm-hmm. that there's no rule of thumb. Uh, I know of some funds, some large US funds that decided to just take kind of a, a similar approach. Okay, like let's mark everything down by 30% and that's okay. It doesn't matter if it's performing well or bad, 30% across the board. Yeah. Uh, some other people took into account kind of um, the runway of the companies, if they they had to raise within the next year or not, uh, all of these things, kind of operational metrics, public market comparables. So, yeah, a, a lot of stuff happening in terms of how to mark down things. Uh, I'd say most stuff was probably marked down between 20, 30 percent, I'd say, mm-hmm. on average. Um, but, yeah, but again, there's no kind of right or wrong there. It's really, I, I think it really has to be kind of a, 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 a company specific decision. And even within the same company, I've also had discussions with the with fund that, Okay, this company should, is overvalued and should be marked down on the seed round. But the Series C round, the company has literally more cash in the bank than the, than the round, and the round has liquidation preferences. So, if the company were to shut down tomorrow, the Series C investors would be made whole. So, there's no you you should mark down the seed, but there's no real need to mark down the the late the last investors. So, there's no really rules there. Um, it's really about kind of try to be very thoughtful and mindful of that. And it's always easier to mark stuff up than down. So uh, mm-hmm. if you have a, mar- a markup now, an up round now, now, I mean, maybe just don't mark it up. You can just keep it on the books. You can have something like a synthetic multiple or something to show to your companies, okay, this is what it would be worth, but we are keeping it at cost. Because this way you avoid kind of spikes in performance where, okay, I have a 2 billion uh, company performance increases from 2 to 3x and then that company is revalued at 1.2 or something and the performance goes back to uh, 2x or something. So mm-hmm. it's a lot easier to explain that you are being conservative rather than that you are just going with the flow. Sure. You know? And the problem with that thing is once you mark something up, you cannot really just mark it down by your own will. You need to either audit stuff or you need to have proper comparable. So you, you need to do proper financial accounting there. You cannot just decide, okay, I want to mark this, that, there, that. So you need to, uh, so it's a lot tougher. So it's better to be conservative. Uh, I think, especially in the last and in the next couple of months, where I would expect some volatility uh, yeah. with valuations. Yeah, yeah, no, that's uh, that's helpful. So I think also in summary too, just kind of thinking through how you're uh, packaging your reporting to the LPs, especially with all the um, things that are happening in the current markets. That's that's really good insight. Well, hey, Rodrigo, I know we're over time. Thanks for staying over a little longer. Uh, this was amazing. So I think you really, really I'm went sure. deep on. Um, all the all the um, quantitative and qualitative metrics, which I think is going to be super valuable for the community, and and just thanks to you and your team for all that you guys do, uh, supporting the um, the ecosystem. It's super valuable. So, again, Likewise. you know, grateful for the friendship, and hope to catch up, and we'll see you um, see you soon. Likewise, have a great day. It was a pleasure. Yeah. yeah, it was fun. Take care. Have a good one.